My name is Sylvia Toy. I used to be a sculptor. I had to stop doing it because I developed a very serious allergy to sawdust, but I made a lot of sculpture. I had a lot of wonderful hours carving, and the most fun part of it is that I taught myself. I started doing video um, around 2006. I had been trying to be a playwright. Some of my friends think my work is not that bad, but I was a dramaturg um, from about 2005 to 2010, and I know that there may be people with less experience as writers than I am, but a lot of those people have a lot more natural talent than I do. And around 2006, I think, I ran out of things to write about. Um, and I bought a camera my first camera. I didn't know how to use a camera. I had taken a photography class with my best friend when I was in college one summer when um, I was only working part-time, I think, and she wasn't working at all. And um, she was taking the photography class to keep herself occupied. She was talented. She had little uh, natural ability. As a photographer, I was terrified in the dark room. I could not figure out how to load the camera. And so here, 30 years later, maybe even, well, maybe even 40 years later, I was buying, almost 40 years, I, here I was buying my first camera and hearing, um, start out with just one camera, but sometimes there were th three cameras in my purse, um, teaching myself how to shoot because I, I always research everything before I start doing it. And I had read that the best way to learn how to shoot is to do it every day. And um, I already knew because I've been <clears throat> trying to be a professional artist um, for almost as long ago as it was I took that photography class and I know that just like the best thing for a, a novice writer to write about is what he knows the best thing for um, a videographer uh, a rookie photographer to shoot is what they know, what's on their daily path. So I was shooting on my way to work, I was shooting on my way home, I was shooting on my lunch hour, and I knew my subjects. So I, my eye and my understanding of what the camera was teaching me happened pretty, pretty rapidly because what I had learned was what was going on around me on the street, what was going on around me on the bus or the subway was a hell of a lot more interesting than anything that I was ever going to write, and that's too bad. But at least I picked it up. I mean, there must be some gift in in tuning into things and and I'm not a my a lot of my work is documentary style, but I'm not a documentarian. I studied story for so long that I even I even put stories in my paintings and sometimes my sculpture. So um, um, I was really happy to find that I had subject matter, real life. 
I think the only reason why I had any success at all, I was produced by people other than myself. I was, I was often, for, for about three or four years, I was often paid um, on a regular basis for um, performing my plays. I toured them around, I traveled them around, I got some nice reviews. Um, I was a solo performer, so I was performing my own plays, and um, I think that that the honesty I have as an actor, it took me a long time to develop technique, but the honesty, the, the real person, it's like I when I'm on stage, whether I'm playing a character who's myself or whether I'm playing a character who's somebody else, it's like I pulled my skin off. And I think, I think what happens is the emotion just comes out. I don't, I just don't cover anything up emotionally. I just, and if I feel any intellect coming into my work. I know it's dishonest, I know it's a lie, and I have to start over. So, being well taught as a writer, when I did first start writing plays, I wrote about uh, my experiences as a child in the Civil Rights Movement. I wrote about the experience I had having church um, in our living room because my extremely well-educated, extremely intellectual, well-read parents were um, practically evangelical Christians. I don't know how that happened. Maybe part of that is the influence of of religion in uh, black culture, but my parents invented their own religion. They had decided they weren't satisfied with organized religion. They pull us, pulled us out of church, they pulled us out of Sunday school, and we had interpretive Bible readings in our living room. And um, it was it was a fun piece to write. I, when I first started writing it, I was, was kind of liberating for me because I think that was the first play I wrote where, um, a solo play that I wrote where um, my parents were characters. And there's, there's a lot of catharsis in playing your dad. Um, being himself and trying to be honest as an actor, um, I had to develop some empathy. I still don't understand what the Christianity was about. My father taught me about molecules when I was eight or nine years old and I was almost instantly a baby atheist because I didn't understand why do we need God? if molecules all hold together in the universe. And I, I never, I never, it's like I jumped immediately to atheism and I had doubts until I was about 13 or 14 years old. But the, it was torturous for me <laughs> to be at the Bible reading um, because I just didn't believe. And um, they eventually, um, they eventually, uh, what, what's the word, excommunicated me because I was a non-believer and a heretic against the, uh, their new religion. I think they called it the Church of the New Man. And I, I, I survived it okay. I mean, I bounced out of it on my own. Um, I think it might have been more problematic for uh, my three younger siblings who all adopted um, their own 
religious beliefs and affiliations when once they were adults. But I think that my parents, um, my parents had a lot of inner stuff to work through. I don't believe that everybody does work through their inner stuff unless some terrible thing has happened, like a, the death of a child or um, uh, they, there's a maiming or a severe illness. They just, they just were troubled souls and they found a way to fix their souls and it, and it worked for them. And, and as they got older, as we got older, they, they loosened up. They weren't, they weren't proselytizing um, us anymore and they were more accepting of our beliefs and it was, it once again, um, when we were young adults, became a more healthy um, intellectual environment. Very, very stimulating. I'm, I'm, I'm glad because I don't believe I'm a naturally uh, spiritual person and I think that's a weakness of mine. Um, I'm, I'm glad that I had that early exposure um, um, to um, religious study and um, um, analyzing ideas and taking them apart and putting them back together in a way that just doesn't come natural for me, you know. I believe in molecules. Um, so that's the first part piece I wrote about my own experiences and the next piece I wrote about my own experiences were um, after I had um, entered um, therapy for the first time for bipolar disorder. I had known since I was three and a half that there was something wrong with me and I experienced um, what I, I can't imagine was anything other than a severe depression. I probably for about, it felt like it lasted forever, but I think probably um, it was more like four to six months where I felt like it was dark all the time. That's how um, I described it to my mother. And this was in 1954, 1955, and I, I don't think... If there were any at all, there, there, there were just so, so, so few people probably who knew that children, that young toddlers, could experience um, depression and other forms of mental illness. I, I'm not, uh, I'm not a, 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 sci a scientist of the mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm a. I'm a I'm an artist who likes physics. <laughs> Very simple physics because I never took it in school. Um, I've um, sort of adopted it as a sort of a hobby as I become an adult. So I I don't know what this what the history is of the study of mental illness in in uh, young people and children was at that time. I, I have read that the worst um, uh, psychotic features are the 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 worst an episode of depression or mania or delusional thinking or hallucinating is the the more stress. Um, the the person who's ex having that experience is under. I think that my parents were very nervous people. Uh, they became politically active in um, Denver, Colorado when I was in grade school. I did not know at the time that uh, my father um, was experiencing unbelievably blatant racism for the northern United States um, post-Brown, um, Brown v. the Board of Education. 
um, from his uh, field supervisor. He worked um, for the Social Security Administration as a claims representative, and the man just would not give him a transfer, a, a, a promotion. For my father to have a promotion, he would have had to go to the homes of people who were disabled or elderly to interview them and help them with their claims, set up a claim, investigate. And uh, my father was told by his field supervisor, I can't send you, a black man, out to those white women's houses. I can, I can see how just that would have been enough to um, uh, cause stress um, in a household. Um, even though my parents didn't talk about it around us, like I would remember, and because um, I mean I'm a I'm a sponge. Anybody who's a writer, whether they're good or bad, is a sponge for information for what's going on around them. And I've always been pretty aware and alert, and I'm not good at shutting out stimuli. That's part of the problem. Part of the reason why um, I'll just just add that to the stress bucket. <laughs> my my father's situation, my own um, my own difficulty in um, filtering out stimuli, um, and my mother. Uh, we lived in Denver uh, in the early 50s at a time when the population was just exploding, exploding. And um, there were a lot of people um, moving to dinner who, Denver who were like my parents, that all different races, all different nationalities, um, young families with children, college-educated people who um, they just wanted a different kind of life. They wanted a more diverse life for their children um, and the the elementary schools I think most of them um, the, the one I was in and the one a little bit farther over um, from us I can't remember the name of it but my school um, um, Harrington was on double sessions where where half the kids came to school in the morning and there there was no racial separation, you know, black and white and Asian and, um, and Hispanic kids were, and the children of some of the foreign students, I imagine, were going to school. Half of us were going to school in the morning and half of us were going to school in the afternoon. Well, that, that's just not good. I mean, I'm not even a parent and I, I just, I just can't imagine how that could be good for um, for children in public school unless the system was designed that way, which it is not. Um, it just was not, our public school system was just not built for that kind of structure. The teachers were overstretched, the, the um, facility was overstretched. And so my mother was really active in the PTA. In fact, one year, or one or two years, I think she was the president of the PTA. And she was a real firebrand. And short-tempered when she was younger, explosive, very colorful and beautiful, and stress-creating. So let's throw my, mother pers my mother's personality in the stress bucket. And um, they were, my parents were involved in the community be, beyond that. Uh, my parents very often um, were the, the people at our church who um, had the key and would open the church door in the morning for the Sunday school teachers and for the kids who were coming to, some, to Sunday school. Because when I was a kid, Sunday school happened um, 
the younger kids at Sunday school before church and the, the older kids, I think, had the option to have attend a Bible study during the service, but um, I think the preference was that children would be part of the church service. So somebody had to open the church door, and a lot of times that was my parents. So they were also involved in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and the Methodist Youth Fellowship, which was the high school students group that they very often met at our house or um, um, would go on weekends to retreats um, uh, with one parent so that the other parent was at home with four kids. Um, let's add, add, add that to the stress bucket. One parent with four kids under eight. Yeah, I don't think it was a good idea to do that myself. But hey, I didn't have kids. I'm not an expert. So, um, so it was it was very interesting. My friends have always said, but your parents are so interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, so one retreat with the youth fellowship, my parents took us with them. I think they couldn't get a sitter or something, filter or something. Or maybe, maybe they actually wanted us to go, but of course that was very boring for us. And most of those high school kids just didn't like us. I, I don't know why. I think that because my parents were so hands-on with us and involved us so much that I think that a lot of the, the um, black uh, parents at our church thought that we were spoiled and that uh, we were given preferential treatment because of our parents. I think that was part of it. There was one particular girl, high school girl, who she, if, if they had cheerleading in her school, she probably was a cheerleader. She was pretty and, and um, everybody, all the kids kind of sucked up to her boys and girls. And, you know, she was kind of light-skinned like me and very symmetrical and perfect and she didn't have any pimples. That was part of it, too. That's what I remember about her, is that she had, like, the most amazingly clear, beautiful skin. And um, so my father is... People have asked me if he was a preacher before they knew what he did for a living. And he, and he wasn't, you know. He was a claims representative for Social Security, but he was a good public speaker. And as my mother was, in fact, my parents met backstage doing a play in college. Um, and so, you know, they were accustomed to making presentations. They had training in making presentations. And my father was leading a discussion that began with a lecture about some principle um, that from some chapter in the Bible. I can't even remember if it was Old Testament or New Testament. I think it was New Testament. We were Methodists. So um, I'm like so bored and I don't understand why we have to be there and we have to be quiet and the kids won't let us sit with them. I think I think there was one kid who would, he would always let my brother, he and I think his brother, the, the older boys, would let my brother sit with them. And my sister, my sister, bless her heart, just, just always tried to do what she was supposed to do. I tried to do what I was supposed to do, but I'm like fidgety. I mean, you see how I am, you know, I'm like this, you know, I'm like my father. That's why we're so skinny. But um, my sis, but um, but my sister, and you know she's just so bright, you know, 
speaking of sponges, you know, absorbing information. And she remembers so many things in detail from when, and she's four years younger than me. And she remembers so many things in such detail. I'm like, so I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm fidgeting, which I always do. And I start playing with these rocks. And I don't really think, I mean, I'm eight years old and I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing. And and all of a sudden, one of the rocks rolls down the hill and hits the cheerleader, perfect skin, symmetrical girl who hates us. And she looked back at me, and I will never forget the look on that girl's face. I just, she just looked back at me with utter hatred. I mean, what was her deal? You know what I'm saying? You're Miss Perfect and everybody treats you like your shit doesn't stink and you're going to be mean to a little kid, you know? And, um, and I, I'm like feeling horrible about it and hoping that she's not going to tell my parents and all of a sudden this voice clear as a bell inside my head my some people hear their voice inside their head and some people hear their voice outside their head and it's considered from what i've read it's considered auditory hallucinations are considered less severe when they're inside like maybe it's more treatable or something i don't know if you're schizophrenic um uh, and just starts berating me for what I had did and telling me the girl's going to tell me and telling me all the things are, the bad things are going to happen to me because of that girl. Uh, clear as a bell, I, I heard this voice. And um, I didn't have the voice that often. Um, I don't remember that happening again until... Starting when I was 10 years old and I was, we had moved to Kansas City, um, <laughs> where <laughs> the year after we moved there, my parents uh, pulled us out of school <clears throat> in a um, homeschool protest against the segregation in Kansas City, Kansas. Okay, this is 1961. Brown v. Board of Education, Topeka Board of Education, which of course is the capital of Kansas, and we're in the state of Brown, and we land in in this oh the segregated school where there literally were vermin. None of the water faucets in the hallway on the floor where my classroom was worked. I mean, I am not kidding. There were, I can remember the, 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 the drafts that would come in during the winter because the, because the windows were broken on the first floor and they hadn't been repaired. And, um, my, my parents were just outraged. I mean, we came from Denver you know, the this progressive, diverse, diversive Denver and where people were so, so optimistic about the future and looking at the world in a, in a, in a new way because you just have to, you just have to try to imagine all those young people, all those educated young people who, um, had who had decided to do things differently than their parents did them and they came from all over including from overseas and then we're in this um southern fried school <laughs> and we got the leftovers of the fried chicken and so you know, no way were my parents going to keep us in that school. So they tried to get us into the integrated school, which was eight blocks away 
and um, Hawthorne, the segregated school, was seven blocks away from us. And the, the I can't remember the name of the school. I gave it some name in um, in my play, and I, I can't remember the real name of the school, but it, um, it had eight black students, so it was integrated. And so my mother, you know, they kind of put us on show and on the spot a lot, excuse me, is going to integrate the school. So she takes us over there, you know, like sometime in August when you are registering or re-registering or whatever. And the woman told her that she was going to have to leave. And if she didn't, she was going to call the police because we weren't in that district. Okay, now we're eight blocks away. And I'm not going to talk about gerrymandering in this piece. You can read about it. G-E-R-R-Y-M-A-N-D-E-R-I-N-G. It's an American sin. An old American sin um, that was devised to um, keep people out from the more advantageous, beneficial, um, privileged, um, elite um, parts of society. So um, let's definitely add this to the stress bucket. In fact, I'm sure that that, that plus the fact that the, that the FBI, I assume it was FBI, it might have been the I had, I've never thought about this before, but it could have been the the local government, the government of Kansas City, Kansas, um, who were tapping our phone, and and phone tapping was definitely not digital in those days. And I mean, you you could hear because we were barely past the party line. We actually had a party line um, uh, for part of the time we lived in Denver. And you can hear people on the other line. Well, that's sort of like what this tapping was like. And that's how we knew that our phone was being tapped. And sometimes when it rained and my mother wouldn't let us go outside, we would call the kids up the street and we would all listen on the extensions to these people, you know, who were tapping our phone. And, you know, the Ku Klux Klan was pretty active um, in not so much Kansas City, Kansas, but definitely in Kansas City, Missouri, and they found us. And there were crank calls to our house, you know, like 25 hours a day, no, 27 hours a day. And I didn't find out until I was an adult. My father was checking our car for bombs. He was looking under the hood to see if there was a bomb or looking under the car or whatever um, to see if there was a bomb. I mean, it was it was jumping at the shakes joint. It was definitely jumping at our place. So you can add all that to the stress bucket. And of course, now the floor is completely flooded, kind of like our basement, which is the next time I specifically remember hearing the voice, I don't like basements. And I had serial dreams about basements starting from the time I was a toddler. Um, I think I fell down the stairs or something when I was like two or three or four or something. And so I had this fear of basements um, until, it's really terrible, I had my last basement monster dream when I was around 30. Um, but I had that dream end. I had those, those repeating dreams end before I was in therapy, so I'm kind of proud of that. I did that on my own. And um, I was in the basement to make a birthday present for my mom. 
I wanted to make her a little planner. She loved plants and she had one of the greenest thumbs of anybody I've ever known. That woman could make anything grow. She could bring anything back to life. It was amazing talent. And I wanted to make a little planner for her because she was just stressed out and nervous and losing her temper and unhappy and sick a lot. Um, I was ten and a half. Yeah, something like that. And so I'm down in the basement um, working on this planner. And I had gotten to the point where I had put it together. And it was, I mean, you can imagine I'm like 11 years old. <laughs> and I mean, I was a sculptor. I was a sculptor for almost 40 years. And, I, and I, I'm still, I'm still not a carpenter. I'm just, I'm just terrible at it. I mean, it's like too much measuring and fitting and you know and I want it now you know so this was a lot better for me I sh maybe I should have found a chisel and tried to carve it you know and it, it might be in a museum now who knows um but uh, um I I was proud of myself I really was for getting it put together as well as I did and I knew it wasn't perfect because my father was really good with his hands and he was always building things, which is probably why it occurred to me to do that in the first way, and probably the reason why I, I was even allowed to use those tools, um, which is probably another reason why I was in the basement, because my mother probably would have thought it was too da dangerous for me to use a saw and have big old nails and a hammer, and I think I, think I tried this, but it, it was a hand drill and and um the, the, I just I couldn't do it I couldn't, couldn't couldn't get the logic of it and um didn't have the strength to make it operate correctly and but all of those tools she would have thought were too dangerous and so I'm in the basement and I'm painting my father had given me some paint to paint it it was this this pink kind of a rose pink color. My mother had a dress that color that she really liked. It was a really pretty dress that she had made for herself. And I I was not unhappy with it. I knew it wasn't perfect. But considering my nature where everything has to be right now and um, how I had just stuck to it and done it as methodically as I could, I, I didn't think I should be that unhappy about it. So I was shocked when I heard that voice again. And I, it's really hard to describe to a person. I've tried to describe it to my husband because, um, I don't know, I guess as recently, I think the last time I heard the voice was in 2007. My husband and I were driving on um, St. Francis Boulevard in Marin, which is it's my favorite road in the whole world. It's just so beautiful. Um, it's, it's just beautiful, and we were... We had brought a boom box and we were listening to my favorite Beethoven, the, the Pastoral. And all of a sudden, she starts screaming the tune of, um, of the, uh, I think it was the second movement. She starts, she just starts screaming. And, and the same notes over and over and over again. And it was so loud. I thought, okay, definitely, definitely somebody heard it this time. And I look over at my husband, and he's, you know, I mean, we're, we're on this wonderful winding road, and there's trees and lacy shadows, and we weren't arguing <laughs> about what, about being lost or directions, because it was just, it was just something we liked to do together in the old days and it was 
um, it was uh, after our theater company had really started heating up. We didn't have any rehearsals. We didn't have any any sets to deliver. We didn't have any meetings. We were just enjoying being a, a most of the time happily married couple driving on their favorite road in Northern California. And I looked over at my husband. And he's just listening to the music and driving, you know, just, you know, so, so happy, you know, his long blonde hair kind of flowing because the wind, my window was open. And we both loved the pastoral. And I, and I just, it was like somebody slapped me. And, I mean, it was, that was the emotion. It wasn't like I actually felt it. It wasn't an hallucination that somebody slapped me. And I, and I realized he really didn't hear it. And so about an hour later, when we were driving home, I asked him if he had heard it. And... I mean, he almost seemed sorry to have to tell me, no, he didn't. And that, that was, that was the last time, that's about six years ago. That was the last time that, um, that voice, which I call Susan, I think I started calling her Susan when I was um, still, in like sixth or seventh grade, the worse she got. Um, and she wasn't there all the time. Um, she was there probably at times. I mean, if I if I thought back and really could remember, I mean, as if she's not there, I try not to think about her, but she was really bad when I started therapy. I had a lot of stress in my life. I was I was working part-time in law offices as a library assistant. Sometimes I was paralegaling. I was, I had been picked up as a sculptor by a really hot um, um, gallery in San, downtown San Francisco. I mean, it was a real deal. And I was having to produce. Uh, they were showing my work all over the place. And... I um, had um, some of the the local black theater community had taken an interest in what I was doing, and the heat was on. I'm sure, I'm sure that all that stress is why um, Susan was, I was hearing that voice often enough that... Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't able to block it a lot of the times. Um, and so I was able to write about it and writing about that voice and parsing it and uh, building comedy around it. Like it is kind of funny. It, I mean, it's kind of funny when, when <laughs> you hear this voice screaming at you. I, you know, screaming this one refrain. I wish I could remember which part of the pastoral, the, the second movement it is. Just screaming and nobody else can hear it. Well, that's kind of funny, you know? And when you, when you put it into a context of your real life and your real situation... Well, I, I, I started doing that because my psychiatrist, who, um, he's retired now, he was, ah, man, the mental health community, I mean, people who um, can't even hold a job the way I can, um, you know, people who barely have had an adult life, he's done so much for them. And he explained, I think he had faith in me that I would learn and that I would be able to help myself as much as possible, which I think you really have to do. Pills can't fix you. Therapy, 
the best therapists in the world can help you and teach you, but they can't they can't make that reprogramming happen in your brain. You have to do it yourself, and that means that you have to accept a lot of stuff that you don't like. I was doing too much stuff. I was doing too much stuff. I was perimenopausal. I was trying to be everywhere all the time. I didn't understand <clears throat> that my biggest problem was not depression anymore, but it was the mania, and that is, that's, that's my biggest issue as a as an aging adult is I really have to watch out for that. And and I had a more recent um, therapist who taught me or started gradually teaching me how to cope better with the mania so that I wasn't giving into it and acting out and taking, because I tend to have a lot of rage with my mania and anger and aggression and... Um, he he really helped me do that thing that I could always do with depression starting when I was little as I would watch it happening to me. And I didn't believe when you feel like overstimulated and like you're on fire and electrified that you can actually pull yourself back. Not It's not dissociation. It's like... You just watch yourself. You watch yourself happen. You watch it happening and watch yourself in the middle of it and you see all the things that you, maybe you could stop doing that or maybe you could make an adjustment um, and make things a little easier on yourself. Um, so that's what I did with the voice and and sometimes um when the light starts to change in the spring it's usually um after uh the time change and um i'm really really sensitive to light as a bipolar um and in its it it sets you off i don't know i mean you, may have somebody in your family or you may have classic migraine that sometimes is set off by light or by noise. Well, it's kind of like that. And it, and, and it puts you kind of off kilter. And sometimes if I don't realize that I'm getting off kilter, I never hear anything clearly like the abuse. It's just sort of... And it doesn't, it hasn't happened, I don't think, for a couple of years because I get more and more aware um, and prepare myself when the light changes. I sort of lay low for a few weeks. I only go to work and then come home and watch a movie. And I won't watch movies that are too stimulating. And I won't try to do projects that are too difficult or... Um, um, you know, I try to, to keep my life as simple as possible. I do a lot of cooking when I'm like that because that's, like, easy and it's safe and, and it's not stressful. You know, if it doesn't turn out, you can throw it out. It's like, it's, you know, it's it's stress-free almost for me to cook. Um, but sometimes, sometimes I catch myself... doing that and that's the voice <laughs>